I think we're supposed to go to Revelation chapter 2, this gathering. Last gathering, we went somewhere else entirely. Who here has ever seen Monty Python? Do you remember the statement, now time for something entirely different? That was how this morning was. So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to be diving into a fairly mammoth topic within the scriptures. If I'm honest with you, I think it's going to take a couple weeks. I don't think we're going to get through it in one. And we're going to be talking about the Nicolaitans. Now, I thought this word that Dan gave about evil authorities which work to sow chaos, that really is precisely what Nicolaitanism was within the life of the church and maybe still is today. So two disclaimers before we get going. Are you guys okay with some disclaimers? Awesome. The first one is this, that it's going to take us a while. We're going to study this in depth. We're going to go slow. We're going to be academic, so put your academic hats on. We're going to go down some rabbit trails, and if necessary, maybe even spread into a couple weeks. The second disclaimer I have for us in this passage is Jesus' rebuke within this passage is actually quite severe. He's even going to verbalize hatred. Now, I want to bring us back to a particular truth within this passage. We know that within the letter of Revelation, Jesus is going to address seven different churches. Now, within four out of seven of those addresses, Jesus is going to speak to things he loves and praises within the church, and he's also going to speak to things that he hates. See, that's a majority, four out of seven. So I think we would be humble as the people of vintage this morning to approach this passage with the assumption that when Jesus looks at our church, when he looks at our lives, there are things which we're doing well, there's things which he's dispensing praise on, but yet there might be other things which he hates. Our job, find out what those things are, repent and restore to his right, be restored to his right path. Now, why does Jesus hate these things? I want to begin with that question. Well, if we go to the end of this morning's passage, which is Revelation 2-7, Jesus is going to make a statement to the church of Ephesus. He's going to make a promise. He'll say, to everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Why does Jesus hate certain aspects of what we do? Because he's compassionate and he's loving. He despises those things which stand in the way of our partaking of the life he's prepared for us. I want to get a little bit personal um, and maybe a little bit strange at first. Kelly and I have a daughter. Her name's Amelia. She's about six months old, and she really despises sleep, which is a problem. And so we have this stuffed koala. Now, it's not a real stuffed koala. My wife and I don't go hunting in Australia and bring them back. It's a toy. And one of our friends gave us this stuffed koala to help get our daughter to sleep. And it's really kind of disturbing in the day because it plays music and it breathes really heavily and it's kind of disconcerting to look at. But at the nighttime, it sometimes works to get her to sleep. The problem is, though, Once she's asleep, cuddling this koala, by that point, I can't sleep because I'm staring at how beautiful she is, and I'm so engrossed in the life that she has. And oftentimes, I'll be awake in the middle of the night thinking, my goodness, there's nothing I wouldn't do to keep you away from the things that could harm you. Now, Jesus will say, if us human parents being evil still know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more immense must the Lord's love be for us? How much more does he hate the things which stand in the way of our partaking in life? Jesus will say, I've come that you might have life and life abundantly. So that's the foundation of our passage this morning. Jesus hates sin precisely because he loves us. We need to remember that. Because Jesus might rebuke us through this passage. He might even discipline us. But the intention of God is that this communication is for our benefit, that we might partake in the life he's prepared for us. Does that make sense? 
Awesome. Well, let's stand for the reading of the scriptures. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'll be in the New Revised Standard Version this morning. It says, To the messenger of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of my God. Awesome. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to be moving through a lot of material this week and next. So if you want to scan the QR code in front of you, it actually has my notes, and you can follow along there. Jesus is going to say to the church at Ephesus, this is to your credit. Remember, he's just rebuked them for leaving their first love. But here he brings affirmation saying, this is to your credit that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus is telling the Ephesians in this passage, your most favorable attribute, the thing that you have an A plus grade in, the thing I'm giving you 100% in, is your hatred of the works of the Nicolaitans. I prefer the Greek form Nicolaite. Now that seems strange, doesn't it? We don't typically think of hatred as being a most admirable attribute. If we fast forward to Jesus' rebuke, of the church at Pergamum, we'll discover that the Nicolaitai were propagating a teaching. So what we have is a teaching of the Nicolaitans and works of the Nicolaitans. Let's hold those two things together, which means when these passages are understood together, we're going to find a teaching that results in a very specific kind of activity. As a false teaching, Nicolaitanism was corrupting the daily moral behavior of believers. The passage indicates that this teaching was splitting believers' inward alignment with Jesus from their outward obedience to his commandments. And what does Jesus say about it? He says he hates it. The result of this teaching is that sin and immorality abounded within the church. Jesus exhorts the Ephesian Christians, and I believe us as Christians today, to partner in his hatred of sin. As we move forward, I want us to tackle a couple key questions within this passage. Here's our academic questions, okay? The first one is, who were the Nicolaitai? Can we locate or at least approximate their historical identity? Were they a heretical group? Were they an actual movement within the early church? Or are they just a symbol for a wider spiritual danger? Next, what works did Jesus hate? What were these false teachers teaching? What were they doing? And what were they encouraging others to do? And last, but certainly not least, the question is, does Nicolaitanism exist today? If so, what does it look like? Where does it show up within the church? And last, how do we contend against it with Christ? So are you guys ready? I was so excited for this teaching. And last gathering, it's like, okay, Holy Spirit, I'll let it go. (laughs) So if we go to the Greek word for Nicolaitan, the word is Nicolaites, and it's a compound word. It's formed of two smaller words. One is nikao, which means I conquer, and the other one is laos, which means people. If you take these two words together, it might say something like, people conquerors. The Nicolaitans were conquering people within the life of the early church. I don't know about you, but I don't really like it when people come and conquer me. So what were the Nicolaitans doing? 
Were they austere and harsh as pastors? Were they encouraging believers to do things they didn't want to do? Now, that's interesting speculation, but my problem with it is it really doesn't get into the nitty-gritty of what was actually happening here. So I want to first consult the church fathers. We can say, hello, church fathers. So Irenaeus, a Christian within the second century, is going to identify the Nicolaitai with a deacon by the name of Nicholas who shows up in the book of Acts. Now, he contends that this deacon, this leader within the early church, later lapsed into false teaching. Hippolytos, another church father, is going to agree with Irenaeus. Well, Epaphanius argues that Nicholas was an ascetic Gnostic false teacher who taught polyamory and even encouraged other men to have sex with his wife. Seems like a real stand-up guy, if that's true. Now, the church father, Clement of Alexandria, somewhat problematically, is going to argue with them and go, no, Nicholas was a holy man. We shouldn't associate him with this group. And by the time we get to the medieval ages, things get much more vague. And Thomas Aquinas is like, well, maybe Nicolaitanism is just a symbol for the sexual distortion we find in most cults. So while the church fathers are worthy of attention, you guys know that I love to hang out here, right? Problematically, they don't really help us get to our answer, do they? I believe the scriptures themselves provide a much better answer for who were the Nicolaitai, what were they teaching, and what was their teaching causing within the early church. Jesus will say in his rebuke to the church of Pergamos, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel, so that they would eat food sacrificed to idols and engage in sexual immorality. So you similarly have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. I want you guys to be honest. Who in this room is like, who on earth is Balaam? Anyone? You can be honest. I see a few hands. And a lot of us are probably like, who on earth is Balak? What is St. John talking about here? Well, if we go back to the early um, scriptures, we'll find an answer. Within the construction of St. John's sentence, he has an adverb which is similarly, which in the Greek is homoios. I'm not going to make you do what the youth kids do and repeat it after me this morning. But it connects the teaching of Balaam to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which means that these teachings are really the same teaching. And what did Balaam and the Nicolaitai teach others to do? Eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual sin. All right, who's Balaam? Let's figure that out. Within the Hebrew scriptures, Balaam was a wicked Gentile prophet who received compensation from a Moabite king named Balak to place curses on God's people, Israel. Now, that didn't work out very well for him. He couldn't actually find success in doing it. So Numbers chapter 25 and 31 would say, when Balaam's method failed, he later recruited Moabite women to work as prostitutes and so bait the Israelites into destruction. So if we're looking at these two ideas, the Nicolaitan teaching and the Balaam teaching, what we can understand is that this method uses idolatry and sexual immorality to keep God's people trapped. Without ascertaining the precise identity of who the Nicolaitai were, we can conclude that they corrupted the Christian faith by contending a person could inwardly be a follower of Jesus while outwardly continuing an unrepentant idolatry and sexual sin. I'm going to repeat that. The Nicolaitans corrupted the Christian faith by contending that a person could inwardly be a follower of Jesus while outwardly continuing to practice unrepentant idolatry and sexual sin. Does that make sense? You guys tracking with me? Cool. We'll keep going. Now I want to focus on what were the works that Jesus hated? Let's really dig into these sins and see what they were. One is food sacrifice to idols, and the other one is sexual immorality. Now, most of us have gone to King Supers 
Maybe you're like me and you shop the clearance section and I have yet to find food sacrifice to idols there. So the question is, what does this say to us as modern listeners? How are we to understand it? Are you guys ready for a rabbit trail? Cool. Let's go to Acts chapter 15. There's a moment within Acts chapter 15 when an apostolic throwdown breaks out over the issue of Gentile circumcision. Now, if you're going to get into a theological fight, circumcision is definitely the place to go, right? And we find Paul in this passage, Peter's in this passage, James, the bishop of Jerusalem, leading the party of the Pharisees is in this passage, and they argue it out. They ask the question, do Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to follow Jesus? They seek out the direction of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of this council, which becomes a model for the later ecumenical councils, the church, James, the brother of Jesus, gets up and he announces a verdict. He says, we should write to them, the Gentiles, to abstain only from things polluted by idols. Does that sound familiar? And from sexual immorality. That sounds familiar too. They'll later say that Gentiles must also refrain from things strangled or from blood. Now, I want us to notice the Nicolaitans' teaching is a near direct contradiction of what the apostles claim is true at the Council of Jerusalem. The book of Revelation will even claim that these false teachers, the Nicolaitai, claim to be apostles but are not. As false teachers, they attack the authority of the scriptures and also God's church by setting themselves up as an alternate source of spiritual authority. Are you guys following me? And I think there's something of a Nicolaitan spirit common amongst most pseudo-Christian groups and cults, which says something like, hey, the scriptures, the apostles, those people you know about at church, they're wrong. Let me tell you the real truth about God. Has anyone ever encountered someone like that out in the world? Islam makes that claim. Mormonism makes that claim. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, and I could go on. All of them, like the ancient Nicolaitai, say, hey, we are the advocates of God's real truth. Don't listen to what the scriptures have to say about this. Don't listen to the people you know at church. And I think it's interesting that many of these cults have actually introduced sexual sin into the life of the church. Now, Jesus is going to praise the Ephesian believer's ability to both test and discard these false claims. So let's dive into a couple. Let's see where we're at at time. We have eight minutes. Who here wants to keep going? I want to keep going. Let's dive into what these sins are. The first one is an object offered to an idol. You guys can repeat this one after me. It's idolathytos. That's a fun word, isn't it? The youth kids would be like, yeah. Now, there's a problem here that a lot of theologians and pastors have wrestled through throughout the centuries. The question is, why does Paul in 1 Corinthians 8 have a bit of a nonchalant attitude towards eating food sacrifice to idols? Paul will say, hey, as long as you're not participating in the idolatrous worship, the food's fine, go ahead and eat it as long as you're not offending a brother. But yet Revelation is so strongly prohibiting it here. We told you from the onset of our study we'd be honest when we didn't have an absolute answer. And this might be one of those mysteries where we have to go, gosh, I really don't know the foolproof answer to this. But who here loves our study team that they at least give it a good shot? <laughs> so our study team came up with some awesome answers which might potentially be solutions to this problem. The first one is, Maybe Christians were prohibited from participating in idolatrous worship, but they weren't necessarily prohibited from buying the meat at the marketplace later. You can think of it like the clearance section at King Supers. The next one is maybe God assigns differing levels of accountability to a young versus a mature believer. And last but certainly not least, maybe the sacrificial food is just being used as a broad symbol for idolatry. Now, we've got some good speculation here. And perhaps the best truth of all is for us as 21st century believers, the historical details really matter less than the principle, right? 
The aim of Jesus' condemnation is that Christians are taking on the idolatrous practices and sexual immorality of an unbelieving culture. Jesus says, I didn't call you to be like the world. So let's dig into this question further and really talk about what did these idolatrous practices look like in their historical context? If we back up to ancient Israel, sacrifices are a holy act. They're commanded by a chainless, changeless God. He's also a chainless God, by the way, too. By a changeless God who doesn't have any external needs. Now, God doesn't command sacrifices because he's hungry, right? No, instead, they emphasize the dignity and presence of life represented by the blood. And they also represent the requirement that Israel, God's people, be cleansed of its sin, its uncleanliness, and ultimately the consequences of sin. Now, if any of you have ever taken a Greek literature class 101, you'll know that the pagan cultures of antiquity were way different. Zeus had more affairs than we probably can count on our calculator. The Greek gods were full of appetites, desires, needs, wants, whims. So if I was an ancient pagan, I would go to a temple to offer a sacrifice as a bribe. I would seek to bribe the god, hey, I want this, Zeus, could you make it happen in my life? It was a transactional relationship. It wasn't the relationship that Christ calls for. The ultimate aim of paganism was the freedom to live according to my own wants, whims, and desires. And if you dig through history, most of the times when pagans were making sacrifices, the thing they were really seeking out is, would you gods just leave us alone? Quite interestingly, if you wanted to find a very religious place within ancient Rome, it was actually the military. Soldiers were the most religious among the pagans. Why? Because they were ready to offer sacrifices to any god who might tilt wartime circumstances in their favor. So for now, I think it suffices to say that pagan offerings, these food sacrificed to idols, were intended to satisfy the appetites of whimsical gods. Why? Because human beings were granted selfish blessings and most importantly, guarded from divine interference in their life. Jesus is going to remind his reader, I am not like the false pagan gods that you're familiar with. My favor cannot be bought, and I don't turn a blind eye to lifestyles of disobedience. Your relationship with me is not a transaction, and most of all, I cannot be bribed so don't participate in the wicked acts which, attend, which offend and test my character. Does that make sense? So we've worked through food sacrifice to idols. Let's give ourselves a pat on the back. Are you guys ready? We'll unpack one more sin, and then we'll probably have to be finished for today, which means next week. <laughs> Let's talk about sexual immorality. This word is porneo in Greek. I'm definitely not going to make you say that one. And it means I fornicate. I commit illicit sexual acts, or I prostitute myself. It's really a broad word within the scriptures that can denote a lot of different things. One is extramarital sex. The next is prostitution. The next is what I would like to call two-directional lust. I'll unpack that for us. And most importantly, it's a scriptural symbol for human unfaithfulness to God. So what does two-directional lust mean? That's kind of a an interesting term, isn't it? It means finding gratification and giving sexual attention to a person who isn't my spouse. Jesus is going to speak to that in Matthew 5, 28. And it's also going to mean finding gratification and receiving sexual attention from a person who isn't my spouse. Revelation is going to use that symbolically a lot in chapters 17 and 18. So we know that this verb encapsulates both lust and sexual immodesty. And quite interestingly, in the realm of linguistics, it's actually the ancestor to the modern English word, pornography. So what were the Nicolaitai doing? They were teaching believers that faith in Christ and a continuous and unrepentant immoral lifestyle could coexist. 
Nicolaitanism was a moral heresy. It gave believers permission to follow their own appetites, just as long as they were maintaining a religious exterior. The inspired words of Scripture is that Jesus hates this. He hates the intentions of those who try to make sin okay. And the word he uses for the trap of idolatry and sexual immorality is scandalon, and Jesus is going to use it too in the Gospel of Luke. He says, occasions for sin, scandala, are bound to come, but woe to anyone who through, they, through whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the bottom of the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Pretty severe, right? I want to push it just a bit further. Jesus is not making a pop-savvy message here. He not only praises hatred, but even more counterculturally, he moves on and he praises intolerance. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. The word he uses is bastazo, which means I bear, I put up with, I lift up, or I exalt. Think about that. I know that you cannot bear wicked people. I know that you cannot put up with wicked people. I know that you don't lift them up and exalt them. And remember, wicked people is defined here as the Nicolaitai, those who tell others that it's permissible to sin. The Apostle Paul is going to illustrate this in his letter to the Corinthians. He writes, And are you arrogant, speaking about a man living in open sin there? Would it not have been better if you mourned so that he who has done this wicked thing would be removed from among you? As Christians, we're absolutely forbidden from blessing, excusing, and even tolerating the sinful things which Jesus hates. We're to humbly and compassionately encourage repentance, not sin. It's a religiously disguised arrogance to contend that we as human beings, finite creatures, possess a more elevated, loving, and truthful perspective than our Creator. We get to choose. Are we going to participate in the design which our God both loves and intends, are we going to partner with the things which he declares, I hate? Does that make sense? Man, we're in the red right now. <laughs> remember, remember, remember. This is set against the backdrop of Jesus' love for his children. He desires that we would have life and life abundantly. That's why he hates the things which harm us and lead us away from that end. We must always keep that at the forefront of our mind. So we're going to have to veer into next week, but remember, our Lord is breaking chains. He's breaking those things that bind us so that we can participate in the life and the paradise which he's prepared for us. Would you stand with me so I can pray for you and myself? <laughs> Lord Jesus, I think it's appropriate to pray the words of your servant David from Psalm 51, which is, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and make me and make our church willing to obey you so that we can be examples to sinners that they might return to you. Lord, we know that this is difficult, but the promise of the scriptures is that you discipline those who you love. So Lord, we receive this word. Examine our hearts this week as we spend time before you in prayer. Could you articulate those things which you hate so we can be drawn back to the life and the love which you always intended for us? We remember that you are a good, good, good father. Your intentions are so much better than we can imagine. So don't let us be distracted by Nicolaitan nonsense. Let us return our eyes and our hearts to you. We ask this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.